Well, let me begin by thanking all of you for being here. It's a gorgeous day outside, so the fact that you're in here, we have to make it as interesting <laughs> and fun um, as being outdoors. And it's why I wanted to do this conversation style. Um, I think we're all getting a little tired of speeches. Anybody feel like they've heard too many speeches in their lives? <laughs> Um, and part of public diplomacy is conversation. So I hope today is a rich and robust conversation. Be thinking about your questions and comments um, early on, because I would like this to be very much a dialogue. Women and girls, cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy. I can't think of a more exciting intersection for everyone in this room who cares about unlocking the potential of half the world, or as Nick Kristof puts it, half the sky. Women and girls make up about 50% of the population. They are not represented, unfortunately, often in our economic, political, social, cultural, educational life of communities around the world. And simply put, that does not make sense. And as Secretary Clinton has said, and I love this, it doesn't make sense to leave women and girls out if you want peace or prosperity or both. You cannot have economic prosperity for any nation if half of their population is not unleashed with its economic power. You cannot have peace anywhere if you are not going to include women. So let me give you a couple of statistics that are current and just give you a sense of what I mean by underrepresented in our peace and prosperity. So around the world we have peace processes. We make peace treaties, there are peace agreements, they end conflicts and societies move on. So we looked at the last, let's say, decade of peace processes and there were 24 peace formal processes since going back 10 years. And we looked at how many women were signatories to the peace agreements. And I'm going to read you some of these statistics. 2% were signatories. 3% in the peace processes were mediators. 8% the women were negotiators. 5% were witnesses to it. The exception, of course, being Liberia. How many of you are familiar with the story of women in Liberia? It's a great story, and there's a great film to see called Pray the Devil Back to Hell about it. The point of this is that you need to deal women in to peace processes. You need to have their economic power unleashed, and it is an everyone's interest that we make some progress on this front. It is not a women's issue. It is a human issue. It is not a ladies' issue. It is a gender-based issue. Men are equally interested, involved. They want to see this happen in many places. But this is absolutely something that is going to take off, and these numbers are going to change. What types of uh, challenges, though, do you see in, or have you seen over the last you know, 20 years and the change in, uh, the, in this question? The challenges for doing programs aimed at empowering women and girls, um, not only in cultures in which they are particularly disadvantaged or disempowered, but, but really across the, the spectrum. It's not like there are a lot of cultures um, in which women you know, have seats of power. I mean, we can look at our own US Senate for that matter. Um, so what kinds of unique challenges are you seeing with that? And how has that changed over time? How is it improving or not? The challenges are very straightforward. They're cultural, so they're stereotypic in nature. They are often part of the traditional formal structures, the way societies are set up. They are economic in that in many of the countries where I've worked, women cannot get access to land, inheritance, opportunities to start businesses, invest, 
to be entrepreneurs, to be creative economic drivers. And so what public diplomacy actually can do is convene women and girls, put them together with the powerful entrepreneurs and men, make sure they have access to microcredit, make sure they are at the table, in the room, part of the mix, make sure they are elected to parliaments. Many, a few countries now are saying one third, 30% minimum, have to be in the parliament. And I would go further and say not only do these women need to be in the parliament, they need to be on the committees that control the economic purse strings of the country or the national security. This is a national security issue for us and everyone. I don't need to tell this audience because you're all so interconnected how interdependent we are. John Donne once said, no man, I think he meant and women, no man and woman is an island unto themselves. We are all part of the continent, part of the main. So we simply have no choice but to be involved in the rest of the world. The rest of the world has no choice but to be involved with us. So once we get over that interdependency and interconnectivity, we absolutely have no choice but to include not just women, but many marginalized groups. We absolutely need to go with an inclusionary model, a model of tolerance, a model of inclusion, a model that speaks to our fundamental belief in the power of an individual to change things. How many in this room feel that as an individual you can change something, anything? And it's a very interesting question, and when you go home tonight, ask somebody around your table whether they feel empowered to change things. Because this whole public diplomacy revolution, this whole conversation about women and girls, seeing the Chinese learn the Macarena line dancing, <laughs> this is about inclusion, and it's about inclusiveness, um, I do want to at some point tell you the backstory of the postcard from China, but we'll, we'll get to that. Actually, I was going to ask you about that specifically, so go ahead. So I asked that that be included. Did anyone particularly like that little? S <laughs> it's wonderful. It was done by a woman named Maureen Orth, who was married to a man named Tim Russert. And many of you may remember Tim Russert, very wonderful news anchor man who died way too early. Maureen is a Peace Corps volunteer, and she decided that somehow we had ignored the Peace Corps volunteers who do so much in the stead of public diplomacy. So she went out and did a bunch of these postcards, and if you go Google postcards and Peace Corps, you will see many other countries. It, the China one is one I happen to like because of my fascination with Chinese public diplomacy, which somebody can ask about later. <laughs> but um, Maureen did that video, and she's doing a lot more. And it just shows you when you put two cultures in the same room and you let them go, they all went to the prom, which was really very exciting. Well, I wonder if um, you can talk about specific types of cultural diplomacy programs, maybe starting with this. Uh, and why they work, but also I'd be very interested in hearing in your experience what types of cultural diplomacy programs, or, or particularly for women and girls maybe, um, that are less effective or present more challenges. So when we look at this video of the line dancing, I could imagine a skeptical uh, senator on appropriation saying, well, why are we giving money for line dancing in China? Sure. Um, so, you know, justify that. A good question. Firstly, let me give you some examples of some of the things that have been done in the women and girls space over the last few years that have been very successful. One is Tech Women, where the State Department has actually encouraged women around the globe to get involved with one another technologically, to learn the skills, to go to tech camps, to be wired, to use where they have them, cellular devices, and to connect 
with one another, and that has enabled many women to start to create businesses and to scale up businesses. Imagine what you can do if you suddenly can get access to prices worldwide and you're involved in marketing a product. It's just phenomenal what you can do if you have some technical skills. So that's been very, very successful. Culture, yes, absolutely wonderful. But it is not the only, and I know it is seen as soft power. I reject the notion that there's anything soft about that. I don't think we distinguish today as much between hard power and soft power. It's all smart power. That's smart power. But it doesn't need to be just cultural. Let me give you, if we go back in time to the first woman who was speaking about conflict, what happens in Afghanistan when women arrive at a checkpoint outside Kabul? Now take your mind, we're away from line dancing in China. We're in a war zone. We're in a conflict region. And women confront a member of the military. He may not speak the language. Maybe he does. He may not know the culture. Maybe he does. He may not have dealt with many Afghan women. Maybe he has. The military came around to understand that they needed to relate to those Afghan women differently than they had been doing if they were going to stand a chance of creating any community engagement and dialogue that might make the killing field less dangerous. So they put together FETs, Female Engagement Teams. And when you go and you look up female engagement teams, you think, how come I really hadn't heard about these? These are women military deployed from NATO and European countries and the United States who can interact with women in Kandahar, in Kabul, they're in Pakistan, they're in Swat Valley, they are everywhere now. And they are finding that that kind of interaction so improves a volatile situation. Mm -hmm. And that, you know something, these women actually know what's happening in these tribal communities. They know where the conflict is going. And when it comes time to negotiate a peace process, if we get there with the Taliban, they need to be in the room. And they need to be at the table. And their girls need to be in school. So you can begin to see how this all comes around. What doesn't work? Lecturing which is why in just a moment we're going to open this up. Mm -hmm. Talking at people doesn't seem to work very well. Not being face to face at times has its drawbacks. I love technology, 2.0, public diplomacy online, absolutely a place for it. But it should not substitute for being at the same table, in the same room, in a classroom, on a campus, in a Fulbright program, in an exchange program, at a high school, learning English, whatever it is that is a cultural engagement, positive experience, face-to-face, -to -face, together, we should do. I could have done this online today and spoken to you by Skype or video, but I wouldn't feel the same connection. Right. So, on that, I hope we can invite Absolutely. some of your thoughts. Anybody have a question uh, for Tara? And there are no shy people at this institution. I, Frank told me nobody here is shy. Well, PJ, he, he's a bashful, shy guy. I was talking to an Egyptian parliamentarian recently, and she actually made the counterintuitive point that percentages of women in parliaments actually retard their political de development potentially in the in the short term. What you know, um, you know, and or if we're if we're you know interested in percentages, why don't we put a particular percentage on the United States Senate as a as a good example? Leave it to PJ. Crowley to ask a tough question because he always got tough questions thrown at him and dealt with them. They're so easier to ask than answer. Well, <laughs> um, 
there, there is a school of thought that having any quota in Parliament or elsewhere can be a negative. Sometimes people like to point to Rwanda or other cases where women got into the Parliament and didn't do the quote unquote right thing. I'll take my chances <laughs> that having them there is better than not. I think it's for women to decide once they're in the Parliament which way they want to vote. And I think the more opinions and life experiences you bring into a parliamentary body, the more reflective it ultimately will be of the people's will. So I'm one who says, I'll, I'll throw, throw the dice and go with putting more in than less. Max. Uh, hi there, uh, Max Emman. I'm a student here in the Global Communication Program. I want to get your thoughts on exchange programs, specifically uh, with countries that the United States doesn't necessarily have a strong uh, diplomatic relationship, and potentially countries uh, there's, where there's some hostility. Um, is there a place for that kind of cultural diplomacy, uh, even when uh, relations are, are not so good? It's a, a great question. Can I ask Max what you study here? I study, uh, excuse me, global communication, and I also work here at the Elliott School uh, on videography and I uh, things like that. <laughs> Social media. Um, I actually am a proponent of educational exchanges, not only in closed societies, in particular with closed societies. We do have the virtual um, luxury of some virtual exchanges. Uh, the State Department has an amazing Iran embassy online. We don't have a diplomatic presence in Iran, but we do, virtually. It's not as good. Um, we have to deal with the Swiss when we're in country, but you can go on and actually reach people. The problem is the circumvention that the government attempts to do. Um, I believe in exchange programs with Syria. We did them with Libya before Gaddafi fell. We had Libyan kids come to a NASA space camp, even when Libya was a closed society. So I have a sense that particularly when you talk to Fulbright exchange students years later who become prime ministers in their countries, and you talk to people overseas who've been through an American exchange program, they always say, life-changing, change my perception of your cornfields. Many were bit in rural schools. An appreciation, a deep appreciation for our humanity, our culture, our diversity, our inclusiveness. So it's a, it's a resource question because to engage in long-term one-year programs they're expensive, and we're in a resource-constrained environment. So it's nice to say we should do this everywhere, but I think we should do it everywhere. Um, China, the president has said that we're going to have a 100,000-strong initiative in China and in Brazil, getting 100,000 Americans to study in China. Not so easy. The Chinese are not as welcoming to big numbers on the press side in particular as the U.S. So that can often be um, tense, but it's something worth working towards. I don't find many people who leave who say it wasn't a good experience. There are exceptions. There are bad stories. There are always things that go wrong, but for the most part, I think these exchanges work pretty well. Well, and it's true for other types of cultural diplomacy programs. I mean. One of the great hallmarks of public diplomacy uh, was the American Exhibition Program uh, with the Soviet Union uh, throughout the Cold War. It's not like we stopped doing things with them just because they were an existential threat. So. Absolutely. Uh, anybody else? Frank. So I'm interested, in, I'm interested in what you said earlier about the power of the individual. And that's a very American perspective. And it's not a perspective that many other countries or even cultures <laughs> share. And when they look at the, the way they welcome women and the role they carve out for women, they may see the American power of the individual in this sermon that is being preached as just another chapter in the cultural imperialism of the United States and 
rejected. Uh, so how do you address that? And in a public diplomacy, how do you overcome that? The Arab Spring was a great awakening on that subject because I think we did see people coming around to the notion that they had something to say and that their voice mattered. So it began to challenge, it wasn't an American-led initiative that brought people to Tahrir Square. It wasn't an American push that brought Libyans to Benghazi. It wasn't an American who set himself or herself on fire in Tunisia. So I always like to remind people, we, we didn't impose that on anybody. So that begins to suggest that there are chords or at least strains and strands in other parts of the world where the individual does think or would like to think that he or she might have a say or an idea that can be expressed freely or openly. But I think you make a good point because there are structures. They can be religious. They can be cultural. They can be identity-based. They can be clan-based. They can be group-based where the individual is not the empowerment agent. But I, I'm beginning to see a geometric change in this whole public diplomacy picture in the following sense. We used to, when you looked at the world, see things, imagine a rectangle. Things were very linear. Things happened horizontally in the world or vertically. And then we got smart and there was sort of a matrix. Then things went triangular on us. And you referenced it in your comments. The tip of the triangle is the, the grass tops, the leadership, the, the spear. The base of the triangle are all these individual local voices. And we're all aware that somewhere in there the triangle got flipped on its head. And the base, the grassroots, the local voices suddenly seem to be dictating what the leadership should do. We've left the rectangle. I think we're about to leave the triangle. And I think we're going into a circle. And this is tough and complex. Circles are wonderful, except they go around and around and around. And it's very hard to lead in a circle. If you've ever had, you can look at dinner parties. There's no head of the table in a circle. There's no real beginning or end. Social networking, media innovation, the internet, webs, blogs, Google tweets, they're circular in nature. You can cut in any place in the conversation. But I do worry you can get everybody out in the circle or in the square. And you can even tell them what time the revolution is. But what do you do the day after? Who leads? Who decides if the individual should be empowered or not? Who decides if the religious figures are in control and whose voice will be heard? So all of us are going to have to wrestle with this. We love this circular model, but it poses some real challenges. 